Welcome to the third 555 tutorial that JS put together for us. This time we are talking about the by stable configuration in which we are going to learn about how with the proper setup, a 555 timer, you can use a momentary button, momentary switch like these tactile switches that I have here. And if you press one, it goes high and stays high until you press the other one and then it stays low and then it stays low until you press the other one and it goes high again. Now, why you would do this and not just get a latching switch of some sort? I don't know. Who am I to judge? It's your life. You do what you want to do. But there will be those situations where you want this, where you only have a tactile switch, or you want the feel, or something along those lines. And this is that bi-stable configuration where it will be stable, the 555 timer, will be stable in either state, either outputting a 1 or a 0. Unlike the mono stable, which it wants to drop back to one of the stable configurations, or the A stable, where it doesn't, it just can't make up its mind and it's unstable either way, which gives you a nice, beautiful square wave. Now, this is by far the easiest configuration of the three, and we will go over it really quick, and then we will show you some very boring lines on the oscilloscope as it goes from zero to one, and then back to zero as I push a button. It's it just doesn't get any more exciting than that. Good times. All right, so let's look at the circuit diagram itself to see how this is configured. So here we have the 555 timer, and let's just go over the more boring aspects really quick. You have pin 8, that's just the power that needs to be connected to VCC. You have pin 1, that's just ground, that just needs to be connected to ground. You have 3, that's the output. That's where we will, of course, be in this case, hooking up our oscilloscope. And then we have pin 5, that control pin, where you can override the two-thirds VCC input to the upper comparator, which we don't want to do in any of these configurations. And so again, we tie it to ground via a capacitor to get rid of any spurious noise that may occur on the pin. Uh, you'll notice that pin 7 we can just leave floating. That is the, the discharge pin that you can discharge a capacitor through, but we will not be using that. And then pin 6, which is our threshold, which is one of our basic input pins, is tied to ground. And that's going to be kind of interesting because we, we don't even use the upper comparator at all in this configuration. We only use the reset on the SR flip-flop and the trigger, which controls the bottom comparator. So we will briefly go over R1 and R2, and all these are, are serving dual purposes of one, a, acting as pull-up resistors, and two, acting as a limiting resistor so that when you use switch one or switch two, you're not tying VCC directly to ground and blowing up a power supply. And that is all we have for the configuration of the 555 timer. Two resistors, two switches, a capacitor that is not truly necessary for it to actually run, but it's nice just to make sure you don't have any issues. So where it gets a little bit more interesting is internally. So let's look at the inside. So in the normal state where you don't have any of the buttons being pushed, you basically have your inverting input to your lower comparator tied to VCC, which makes that higher than your non-inverting input, which makes your output zero. And then on your upper comparator, you can see that your non-inverting input is tied to ground, which is going to be obviously lower than two-thirds VCC. So your output of the upper comparator to your R is also going to be low. And if you remember from your truth table of the SR flip-flop, if your inputs to R and S or S and R are both zero, it is a memory state. It basically just outputs whatever its last state was. Now, we note that the resistor uh, R1 and switch 1 are connected to the SR flip-flops reset. Now, that tiny little dot at the top of the box of the SR flip-flop means that it's an active low reset. So it doesn't reset unless the voltage drops low. And in this case, it is high. So we're ignoring reset. Both of our inputs to R and S are zero, which it keeps its previous state and we'll assume is zero. But what happens if we push a button? So if I am to push switch two and connect the input to the inverting part of the comparator through switch two, I'm going to drop that voltage down to zero and suddenly that will be a lower voltage than my non-inverting input on the comparator and I will output a high voltage going into S. And again, looking at the truth table of our SR flip-flop, if you have a one on S, a zero on R, 
suddenly Q goes high, Q naught goes low, and then you have this output that flips a signal and you get a high. Now, since you've done this, okay, great. You can push that button, hold it, and you have an, a high output. But as soon as you release, you go back to that last state. And we are back to our inputs to S and R still being zero, going to that truth table with F and S and R being zero. Again, it's just whatever the memory is. So since it was at one, it still remains at one. So pretty straightforward so far. Now, the only change so far that we're going to see is if we close switch one, which ties ground to the reset pin on SR. And basically all that does is makes Q go low and that's it. It just overrides everything else. And so no matter what else happens, your Q of your SR flip-flop goes low and your output's low. And as soon as you release that, you jump back to that original state of switch one and switch two being open. And since it was already low, your output will remain low this time. And that's literally it. Basically, you either force the output high by uh, making that inverting input to the lower comparator uh, drop to ground, making the output of that comparator go high, making the S go high, making Q go high, or you reset the SR flip-flop by dropping it to a lower voltage. And then once you release it, it just sits there in whatever state it was until it's overridden. So extremely, extremely, extremely simple. Very straightforward. Nothing is complicated as the monostable and the A-stable configurations. Very, very straightforward. And with that, let's actually set up the camera and I'll show you. Basically, you're just gonna see the voltage switch up and down as I push the buttons. It's not gonna be too exciting, but let's do it anyway. Okay, so we are currently outputting zero volts. All I need to do is press this switch here and it jumps to a high voltage and, and that's, that's it. I'm giving it seven volts and as you can see, I have five volts down here. So it gives you a nice clean seven volt signal. And then if I were to push the other button, which ties reset to ground, it drops down. That is literally it. And unless something happens, this will stay like that forever or it will stay like that forever. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's it. And so again, very, very basic, straightforward operation, but depending on what you need, could be very useful. As I promised, wasn't too exciting, but still hopefully helped you understand exactly the behavior that you would expect from doing this setup. So thank you very much for joining us on this third 555 tutorial. Please join us on the next one where we go over the A-stable configuration, which is gonna be a little bit more complicated again. If you liked this, give this video a like. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel and we will catch you in the next one. Take care.